to welcome all of you to our time of worship with the Hamlane Church of Christ. 
unfortunately, we can't meet together, but we are still together in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so we're thankful that you've joined with us today to, to worship God and to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, for those of you who are joining us on, online that aren't normally a part of our congregation, we are, we're grateful that you've chosen to be with us on this Lord's Day. I want to remind all of you uh, members of the Ham Lane Church that uh, we have encouragement cards. And if you don't have any, you can come down here to the church and, and pick some up and uh, fill those out and mail them off to the people who um, are going to really, really be thankful that they got it. And they will be very encouraged. So remember to do that. Also, we have communion supplies that are available here at the, the church. If, um, if you want to come by the, the building on Tuesday and Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Kit will be here, and she will uh, be able to provide you with that. And uh, so don't go without if you have that opportunity to come pick some up. Psalm 1846 says, The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rest? Is that the right pitch? It was very high. Yeah, right off the bat. That's a new one. That's not me. That's the front of my car. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that? Rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper. Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. prepare for the Lord's Supper, we will sing a song called If That Isn't Love, Remembering.
Christ at the time of his crucifixion. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the only hill of Golgotha. There to lay down his life for me, if that morning. In this time of social distancing, the six feet rule, wear a mask in public rule, with all these things designed to keep us separated, it's easy to lose sight of community, isn't it? Every nation on earth has its own rules for mitigating COVID-19. Every state has its own rules for mitigating COVID-19. Now, we are even separated by county. Our county can't do certain activities that another county can. And so on. My intent for stating all this is not to start a debate about politics or government policies or the wisdom of such policies, but to remind us all that when our Savior Jesus Christ on the night of his betrayal, when what we are about to do was first instituted, communion was something that was meant to be a communal activity. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with verses Verse 23, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink 
and in remembrance of me. Then Paul adds in verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There are so many things that separate and divide us. Some of them good and some of them bad. With, it, with the good divisions, we should praise God. I'm glad we don't all look alike, right? I'm glad all songs aren't the same. I'm glad that there are some parts of the landscape that are desert and some that are filled with glorious trees. I'm glad that winter is different than summer and fall is different than spring. I'm glad that Mexican food doesn't taste like Japanese food or Thai food like Italian. But when it comes to communion, there is no room for division. And I hope the separation we are now being called to observe only serves to diminish our differences and magnify our oneness. There are things that still divide us, such as distance, such as national boundaries, such as what we determine to be truth and what we determine to be fiction, or what we consider to be the best, whatever. Shampoo, food, sports ball team, you name it. But I pray that when we partake of this bread and this cup, which we are doing to proclaim Christ's death, let's not separate ourselves mentally or spiritually. When we participate in communion and remembering Christ's death and proclaiming his death, do I or do we want to say that because this person or this family or this group over here thinks this way or that, that they can't be part of this process. I sincerely hope not. Andrew McGowan, an Australian scholar of early Christianity writes, the body eaten is focused communally rather than individually, finding the savior's presence in the corporate consumption rather than in the elements taken in isolation. Edward Welch, another noted Christian author writes, we should remember that it is through Christ's death that we are reconciled to God and each other. He has made us one, and we set our hearts on pursuing unity and love. The Lord's Supper is a great time to pray and plan for oneness with our brothers and sisters. It is a time to explore new ways to be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. Another Christian writer by the name of Luke, you may have heard of him, writes in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who would be saved. Luke also writes in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Still another Christian writer that has written a lot of stuff by the name of Paul, writes in one of his many letters, this one in his, letter, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. This writer by the name of Paul has a lot more to say about the Lord's Supper that I don't have time to talk about right now. But one thing more that he writes earlier in the same chapter, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, that really jumps off the page to me. 
Paul writes, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. I don't know about you, but that really makes me think. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, there is no room for differences, much less perceived differences. No room for divisions. As we eat this bread and drink this cup this morning, my hope is that we will all be as inclusive in our minds as possible and think about the fact that there are many people on this planet that will be proclaiming the Lord's death this morning, not just here in Lodi, but elsewhere as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, uh, these emblems which to us represent your son's body and his blood that was sacrificed on the tree for us so that we would have a hope of everlasting life with you. As we partake of these emblems this morning, Father, we pray that we will be inclusive and that we will think of all of the people in this world that are participating in the same acts this morning. Thank you for Jesus and thank you for the blood that he shed on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. During this time of social distancing, obviously it is not possible for us to pass the collection baskets like we would normally do, but what is normal about these times? You should have an address on your screen where you can send your contribution or you can call the building to see if someone is here and arrange to drop off your offering. But I'd like to just read some words of wisdom and encouragement to you this morning. First is from the Old Testament book of Deut Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. It's easy in the current economic and social climate to be concerned about your current financial situation. But the writer of Hebrews reminds us in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And finally, something from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things... At all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. So with these things in mind, let's pray for our offering this week. Father, thank you for this opportunity to lay by in store, as we call it. Uh, we thank you, Father, for all your, the blessings that you've blessed us with. Thank you for so many things that we can't, uh, we can't name them. But uh, we pray, Father, that the collection of the money that we gather here this morning and, and through the week um, will build up this body and this family in this town of Lodi. And we pray that uh, the money will be used um, wisely 
And we pray, Father, that you would bless it to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. This morning we'll be reading it from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul continues in his letter to the Philippians, In relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Good morning, church family. I have the privilege and the opportunity this morning to share with you during our time of intercessory prayer, our, our pastor's prayer time, and especially now that we are once again, hopefully for a very short period and season, separated from one another, n not isolated from each other because we have this opportunity to be together online for our Zoom studies that will kick back up again this Wednesday. But during this time, I really want to encourage you to keep us as your church family, to, to let me, to let uh, Kit in the office, to let our elders know of anything that our prayer needs and concerns in your, in your, in your own life and in what's going on, because we really want to keep up with that. We believe in the power of prayer, and we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. You should have got uh, your bulletin online this uh, for this week, emailed to you. And this does have some things that we're just going to uh, pray over this morning. So if you would, let's, uh, let's spend just a few moments and go to our great God on behalf of others and pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity that wherever we are, no matter what day or what time we might be watching this service, that we can spend time in prayer to you, knowing that you hear, and most importantly, that you answer, and even greater than that, that you answer our prayers in the ways that you know are best. Lord, there are a lot of people on our list, and we just want to lift those things up to you. As I glance over this, there are people here that I know the specific need, and there are others that it seems more broad, or I may not know personally what the needs are, but you know. You know our greatest needs. You know where you need to intervene, and you know where people need to sense and feel your presence and your power in their life the most. So, Lord, I pray for that today. I pray for anyone hearing this prayer this morning that they would experience your presence, that they would experience your power, and most importantly, during this season of just unrest and, and so much uncertainty, that they would experience your peace. I pray for that. Lord, I'm thankful for the missionaries that we support uh, throughout the world, and I am appreciative and so thankful for the generosity of this church family as they continue to support not only the work that we're doing here locally, but with the people we support within our country and outside of our country. Lord, I just pray that we would be able to continue that good work and that you would bless all of their efforts. Lord, I ask that this time of worship that we have been doing with our praise team leading us in songs, with sharing a time with the Lord's Supper together, even though we have to be separated for this time, the opportunities to hear you speak from your word. Lord, I just pray that all these things have been done in a way and in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable to you, that it has been done in spirit and in truth, and that when we get done with this time together today, 
that we would be able to say it was so good for us to worship you. Lord, all these things we pray today through the name of your Son and our precious Savior, Christ Jesus. And all who agree say, Amen. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thy own to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, Pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring, cruel. Willing to suffer, others to save. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image. After this song, we will uh, have Chad come and speak to us, and the song will be Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him. Self to thee, for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give is for to live. Oh, Christ, for thee. My heart 
shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, to redeem, bringing the weary to find rest in Him. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee Well, good morning again, and welcome to Hamlane Church Online. Hey, if you're watching today on Facebook or on YouTube, whether it's live with us now on Sunday morning or it's later through the week, take a moment to hit like, take a moment to share uh, this service with your friends, and let us know by commenting that you're watching, where you're watching from, if there's anything that we can pray for, maybe you don't have the time to uh, spend this whole service together, and if not, that's okay. Just take a moment before you uh, sign off from here and let us know how we can pray for you. Also for our members, uh, as I mentioned before, you should have your e-bulletin that was emailed to you is also located online. If you want to get that uh, ready, it has an outline with some blanks, some scriptures, and some things to help you follow along with our message today. I pray that every one of you had an awesome and a blessed Thanksgiving holiday together, at least as much as was possible to be together during this season of COVID. You know, I had always thought about preaching a sermon on gluttony the Sunday after Thanksgiving. But I've never done that because if I did, I would be the biggest hypocrite in the church. Now, of course, this Thanksgiving, like so many other holidays and special days and events that's been taking place in 2020 since March, has been very different. And I know that for some of you who have shared with me that I talked to how different it was, whether it was having to go to families and just waving from the car. I even know one family that went to see their family and they literally ate in the car while their family ate in the house because of some COVID uh, restrictions that they had. That they, they didn't want to get grandma sick. And uh, I know it's just been crazy and trying. But I do pray that you still gave thanks to God for your loved ones, whether you were able to be with them physically or not, and that you gave some time to thank God for who he is and what he has done for all of us, the so many undeserved blessings that he gives us each and every day. That is something for which we should be thankful. Amen. Uh, today, we're going to continue our series that I started called Now That's Encouraging. And I tell you that I am more convinced than ever that the Holy Spirit of God was working in, in just having me study this book of Philippians and making a decision, even though this was not what I had planned for 2020 last year. Uh, I have kind of been adjusting fire and, and, and just praying for God to give me wisdom, what I could share. And, and as I started to write this series a few weeks, or several months ago now, I, I assumed we were going to be together. Because, you know, we separated for a time, then we were allowed to be back together, and then we were told we had to only be outside, so then we were outside for a bit. Then it started to get cold, we were like, what are we going to do? Well, then all of a sudden, 
our code of color changed and we were allowed to come together again with the restrictions and with the, the minimum numbers in each room. And now here we are again as of last Sunday and this Sunday and who knows, maybe the whole month of December that we are relegated to church online again for Sundays. It, it, it's, it's so discouraging. But, but I want to encourage you to not delay in that discouragement, to be thankful that we have an opportunity to still get together this way, even though we have to physically be separated, we are never isolated from each other unless we choose to isolate from each other. And I think that this series from the book of Philippians that God has placed on my heart to, pray, to preach to you guys is something that we need now more than ever before because we truly need encouragement. And encouragement is something that is seen throughout this book. Now remember, Philippians is written by the Apostle Paul during a time that he's actually in prison. And you think, man, how can someone who's in prison write something that, where he talks about joy time and time again, where he talks about finding encouragement by being in Christ time and time again. And it's fitting in some ways that we're studying Philippians now because to a much lesser extent, I think we can sort of relate to the Apostle Paul with the lockdowns and with so many restrictions from COVID, now with curfews that are taking place. So obviously not to the extent that we're under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard 24 seven, but maybe we have a little bit of a sense of what Paul is feeling when he's not with the people he would like to be with. When he's not able to worship on a Sunday morning with the church family, the way he would like to be with them and worship with them. But instead he still says that he finds encouragement. So last week Randy shared with us from Philippians chapter 2. And I want you to listen to this first two verses. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. And Randy took some time explaining what that looks like and, and what that means. And I hope that we can be encouraged because we are in Christ. And even though things are different because of how different our world is now, our purpose, our mission, and our message remains the same. And that is something that we keep and that we have in common. And that is something that should make our joy complete as well. Now today we're going to cover chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 that David read for us earlier. Now today also happens to be the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is the season of the year that leads up to Christmas. On the church calendar, it's the four Sundays just before December 25th. So today is, is the first of those four. And with today being the first Sunday of Advent, I think this passage from Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at these verses again that David read. This is a perfect Advent passage. Uh, uh, passage, a perfect Advent scripture right here, because this talks about, this deals with the fact that Jesus did come, that he did become human and he humbled himself, he made himself a servant, but then it also talks about his exaltation and how his name is the greatest name that someday every knee will bow before, and it's a great way for us to kick off this season and continue our series in Philippians. So I want you to look, the first scripture on the top of your outline, it's here on the big screen as well. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, more than 100 years ago, back in 1869, a guy by the name of Charles Sheldon wrote a very popular book called In His Steps. And that book, in many ways, was inspired by this verse where Paul says, we, as Christ's followers, should have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. And in Sheldon's classic book, what he wrote, again, so long ago, he helped us to ask the question, what would Jesus do? 
And it's something that has just carried on for the ages. In fact, I can remember during my youth group days in the late 80s, early 90s, when the WWJD, What Would Jesus Do, bracelets were so popular. Now, a little more contemporary of an author, Max Licato, just a few years ago, wrote another book that was sort of based on this passage that he called Just Like Jesus. And in Max's book, his premise, his idea is is that God loves each and every one of us just the way we are, but he loves us so much that he absolutely refuses to leave us just the way we are. He wants us to be just like Jesus. But what does that mean? I mean, what does that actually look like to be just like Jesus? To do what Jesus would do? To act the way Jesus would act? To have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus? Well, I want to show you a couple more translations of this same passage. So look at the next uh, translation of this passage. This is from the NRSV. It says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then the NCV, the New Contemporary Version, says this. In your lives, you must think and act like Christ Jesus. So to have the attitude of Jesus is to have the same mind set as Jesus. And that means that the way I think and the way I act is going to be just like Jesus. That's what asking the question, what would Jesus do during times of COVID? What would Jesus do during this situation at my job? What would Jesus do if he was facing the trials and the the stuff that I'm facing in my life? And when I think about thoughts and action, and you put those things together, that equals character. Because what I think and the way that I act adds up to who I really am, who my character is. So this idea of having the same attitude, the same mindset to think and to act just like Jesus means that I am striving to have the character of Jesus in my life. But what does that really mean? So what Paul does for us in this verse, he doesn't just say you should be like Jesus and then go on. Instead, in these next few verses, verses 6 through 11, he gives us this beautiful, poetic, almost lyrical uh, poem or song. Some Christian scholars think that Philippians 2, 6 through 11 was actually a Christian hymn that the church would have sung during Paul's time, and that Paul kind of took that and he used those words to help us understand what it means to be just like Jesus what it looks like to have the attitude, the mindset, to think and to act like Jesus does. So in this passage, he gives us six, uh, three things rather that I want to show you here on your outline. So if you have it, I want you to fill in these few blanks. Acting just like Jesus means, number one, don't demand what I think I deserve. If I want to be just like Jesus then I don't need to demand what I think I deserve. A lot of people have observed that in our modern time, in our culture today, we're living in a time of entitlement, right? Where people think that, hey, I I am entitled to this. I I deserve this. Therefore, if I don't get what I think I'm entitled to, or if I don't get what I think I deserve, then I'm going to start to demand that I should get what I think I deserve and what I am entitled to. And if I don't get, if I don't have my demands met, well, then I'm going to act out. I'm going to cry, I'm going to yell, I'm going to scream, I'm going to do whatever it takes because I'm going to demand my rights. But when you look at what Jesus did, When you realize that Jesus was the Son of God, that He was Emmanuel, that's what this Christmas season is all about. Emmanuel means God is with us. That He came from heaven to earth. He had a lot of things that He could have demanded that He absolutely deserved. But I want you to see what Paul says in this passage. Philippians 2, look at verses 6 and the beginning of verse 7. Here he's talking about Jesus says, Though He was God... He did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Instead, he gave up his divine 
privileges. You see what it says? Jesus chose to come to earth, and even though he was 100% God, he chose to be man. And he gave up a lot of things in heaven to come to earth for us and not demand what he, pro what he not probably, what he absolutely did deserve. I mean, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he was born in a barn, in a cave, in a manger, because he was willing to humble himself. We're brought up in a time where it's, especially in our country, especially here in America, it's my right. And, and, and we do have rights. And I think that the Bible even speaks about the fact that since we are created, we're the only thing in creation, created in the image of God, we absolutely have some things that, that are rights. But if we are in Christ, we have surrendered those things. And you can, you absolutely can demand something. You absolutely can say, well, I'm entitled to this. That's fine. But just know that if you do, you're not being like Jesus. Because Jesus was willing to give up what he deserved what was rightfully his. And there are much better ways. There are much better ways to get what we want, to get what we even may deserve than to demand it. Now, this is especially true in the church family. I mean, with what Randy shared with us last week, this idea of being of the same mind, of doing nothing out of, out of vain conceit or ambition, uh, but in humility that we consider others, that we're willing to give up what we may want we might even give up what we deserve in order to create unity among a church family. So we need to be understanding, not demanding. That, it's, that that is a possible way for us to be able to say that, Lord, I want you to be exalted over me. And the Bible speaks many times about what it looks like when we humble ourselves before God and we allow God to humble us. But Jesus never demanded what he actually deserved and if we want to be just like Jesus, that's something we too need to emulate and copy in our lives. Here's a second one. If I'm going to act just like Jesus, it means I look for ways to serve others. Look for ways to serve others. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. He, Jesus, gave up his place with God and he made himself nothing. Some translations say he emptied himself. He was born as a man and he became like a servant. If you want to be just like Jesus, you have to learn and you have to look for ways to serve others. The problem is that our world, our society, our culture teaches the direct opposite of that. I mean, we live in a time that says success is measured by self-esteem, status, salary, uh, stuff. That, that, that it, the way that you can show the world you're successful, that you're important, is how many people I have who serve me. How many people are under me? How many people do what I tell them to do? But the Jesus way is that Jesus would go, and even though he was the king of kings, he came down to earth, he emptied himself, he humbled himself, he gave up the privilege of heaven to come be man, to be God with us, and he would specifically look for ways to serve people. Because he would say, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve, and to give my life a ransom for many. See, with God, the one who wants to be the greatest is the one who is the least. The one who wants to be first is the one who is willing to be last. Jesus came as a servant. And if we're going to be like him, we need to look for ways to serve others. And especially during this, this time of COVID and how we're separated, we're not doing things here at the building like we normally would do. That We're not having fellowship meals. We're, we don't have kids' ministries happening the way they used to. And we need to be very prayerful and even creative in ways that we can serve each other and that we can serve the church and that we can serve our community and that we can serve people around us. One of the best stories of humiliation I ever read was of a man who arrived back in 1953 at the Chicago Railroad Station. He was about to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He stepped off the train. He was described as a tall man with, with brushy hair and a big mustache. And as the cameras flashed and the city officials came to uh, shake his hand and to congratulate him, he thanked them politely and shook their hands. But then he asked to be excused for a moment. 
The story tells that, that he walked through the crowd of all the people who had gathered to come see him, the, this, this Nobel Peace, Peace Prize winning man who had done so many accomplishments in his life. He parts through the crowd and he sees this elderly woman who had two large suitcases that she was struggling with. He went beside her and he asked if he could help her. He, he picked up her two suitcases. He escorted her to the train, helped her up onto the train, and he placed her suitcases up there with her. Then he comes back to the crowd that was there to see him, waited for him, and he apologized to them for stepping away like that. Uh, the man's name was Albert Schweitzer. Uh, there's a... One of the reception committee people, one of the members, is recorded as saying to a reporter there, they said, that is the first time I ever saw a sermon walking. And I hope we are sermon walking. Amen? More than just getting up and sharing some words or, or preaching to a camera so that other people can hear it, but that if I'm going to be just like Jesus... I don't need to demand what I think I deserve. And I am going to literally go out of my way and look for ways to serve other people because that's what Jesus did. Let me give you one more though. The last two blanks on your outline is this. If I wanted to act just like Jesus, it means that I do what is right even when it's painful. I do what is right even when it was painful. Philippians 2, look at the, the verse 8. And when he, Jesus, was living as a man, he humbled himself, and he was fully obedient to God. Even when that caused his death, death on the cross. See, Jesus came and he knew what his goal was. He knew what his mission was. He knew what his purpose was. And nothing on this side of eternity was going to prevent him from doing what he knew he needed to do. And he knew the pain and the suffering that he was going to go through to accomplish what he needed to accomplish for us on the cross. He understood the, what he was about to go through that was going to lead to his death even death on the cross. But yet, Jesus did what he knew he needed to do. Jesus did what was right, even though it caused him great temporary pain on this side of eternity, and even death. And yet, he conquers death. He was resurrected. And because of the fact that God sent Jesus to earth that Christmas some 2,000 years ago. And because Jesus did not demand what he knew he deserved, because Jesus did look for ways to serve others rather than being served, because Jesus was willing to do what was right, even when it caused great pain, to lay down his life for us, the result of that, what God did for him because of that, is the way this passage ends. So look at these last few verses, starting with verse 9. Therefore, because of all these things that we just mentioned, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God says he gave Jesus the name that is above all names. There is no name that is greater than the name of Jesus. That's why when people stub their toe or hit their thumb with a hammer, you never hear somebody say, oh, Buddha, right? They say Jesus. Or, they say, or you never hear someone say, oh, my Muhammad. Uh, that stuff doesn't happen. And nobody ever, nobody ever you know, sa says uh, your name or anybody else because there's no name that's greater. And when people are swearing and taking the Lord's name in vain, they don't even realize that the reason they're doing that is because there's no other name that's greater than the name of Jesus. And when he came and he lived that life of humility, when he lived that life of servanthood, and when he was willing to sacrifice his life for us, God gave him the name that is above every name. And the Bible says that one day, everyone, not most people, not some people, not church people. Everyone will bow before Jesus and will acknowledge, will proclaim, will say that he is Lord. Someday, whoever our next president's going to be, 
whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Trump, or somehow it's going to be somebody else. Someday, they're going to bow before Jesus and say, Jesus is Lord. All the actors in Hollywood, all the singers, uh, anyone who has been anywhere at any time on this side of eternity, one day will go before Jesus and say, Jesus is Lord. It's not a matter of if you will say Jesus is Lord. It's a matter of when you will say Jesus is Lord. You can do it now in love, or you can do it later in judgment. It's your choice. So here's my encouragement to you. Be just like Jesus. Have the attitude of Jesus. Have the mindset of Jesus. The way you think and the way you act should be just like Jesus. That's easy to preach. It's not always easy to live. There are times in my life that I don't think and therefore don't act the way I know Jesus would in that situation I'm facing. And there are times in your life that you know you have not acted the way Jesus would act in that situation. But the good news is that even when we fail and even when we fall short, Jesus Christ is Lord. And there is power in that phrase because there is power in that name. And when you're facing something that you feel like you can't overcome, you say, Jesus is Lord. When you're not sure how you're going to get through this problem at your job, when you're not sure if you're going to get a job, when, when we don't know what's going to happen with the church or our country or our city or anything else because of COVID, we can still and we should still and we better still say, Jesus is Lord. Because when we say that, we acknowledge that I'm not and neither are you. There is a God I'm not him, you're not him, Jesus is Lord. That means he's the one who is in control no matter what. Now that's encouraging, amen? That's encouraging. Let me pray for you. Lord, I ask a blessing now as we close this time together upon everyone who is hearing these words that you would help us to have the attitude, the mindset, the thoughts, and the actions of Jesus. Lord, we know and we believe and I pray that we live in a way that we understand that you love us no matter what, just like we are. But you love us so much that you don't want to leave us like we are. You want us to be just like Jesus. I want us to in all areas, in all situations, in the church, at our jobs, in our marriage and in every aspect of our life, help us to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Lord, I pray that, especially during this time when the world is watching, that we who are believers, we who are Jesus followers, would in the best way we know how understand that we don't have to demand what we think we deserve. Because we've been given so much already because of who and what you are in our life. That you would give us the eyes to look for ways to serve others around us. And Lord, that we would always choose to do what is right and to follow you, even when it may be painful and hard for us to do. That's what Jesus did. That's what we want to do. It is his name that has been exalted above all names. And today, the best way that we know how, we do bow before you in spirit. And we do proclaim that Jesus is Lord. In his name we pray. And amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am, just as I am, I would be lost. But thankful that you have spent this time of worship with us and so we're going to sing a, a closing song together and I hope that you will sing right along with us from wherever you're watching Father in heaven how we love you we lift your name in all the earth may your kingdom be Established in our praises, as your people declare your mighty words. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord. Jesus, the church said. Amen. Amen.